Hey everyone, uh, before we get started, uh, I do want to apologize first and foremost for um, not uploading anything for a really long time now. It's been a little over two months, I think, since I, uh, since I last uploaded anything. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I know you guys are almost done school for the year, so um, I do wish I was able to get some videos out um, over the last couple of months so that we could continue doing uh, you know, the things that we've been doing. We were working on linear functions and I had this whole plan that we would finish linear functions and then move on to uh, quadratics and then do a little bit of trigonometry like we did last year uh, and then maybe finish off with some, some fun math concepts. Um, now, of course, it's been a long time since we um, did anything with linear functions, um, at least in these videos. I don't know what you guys have been uh, working with in the meantime. Um, but so what I'll do is we'll just go over, um, I'll just briefly review things like um, what uh, a linear function uh, is, you know, what it looks like the, uh, as an equation. Um, we have done lots of practice with graphing. So um, what I'm actually hoping to do in this uh, particular lesson is I'm not going to focus so much on the graphing. I'm going to do um, an example that's based on the last uh, topic that we covered. So the last topic that we covered was points of intersection. And uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but first, let's just review. Just a brief review. This is our uh, our, technically our next lesson, but just because it's been so long since we had any of these videos. So we'll just do a brief review. So, um, basically what we're working with here is um, a linear function. So that's just a fancy way um, for, for all our purposes right now. Um, linear functions are just lines. So when you draw them on a Cartesian plane, a Cartesian plane like that, I know that axis is a little bit uh, squiggly, but that's I think that uh, it gets the idea across. So any function on a Cartesian plane, that is not a straight line, uh, any function on a Cartesian plane that looks like a straight line, something like, that's also not a straight line, something like, that. Does that get the idea across? That gets the idea across. So something that looks roughly like that uh, in any direction. It can look like this, it can look like this. Anything like that on the Cartesian plane is going to obey uh, an equation that has the same form, the same setup every time. So the equation of a linear function looks the same for any of these lines. Um, you can also have graphs uh, on your Cartesian plane that uh, that look a little bit more complicated. So we um, we would have seen this last year when we did our quadratics unit. Um, we would have seen functions that look more like that look more like this. Functions that look something like that, uh, or or perhaps something like this. So those are quadratic functions, and they are more complicated to work with uh, than linear functions. Um, this was something I was hoping that we could cover this school year, but because we're almost out for the school year. I figure we'll just wrap up this last bit of linear functions um, and then I guess call it a year. Um, but uh, yeah, so these types of functions are not gonna look the same as a linear function, so a line that would look something like this. These curved functions won't look the same as this straight line. So any straight line on the Cartesian plane will have an equation that looks like this. So we've got y equals mx plus b. So just to review, the b value here is the y-intercept. Y-intercept. So this is the value uh, where the line crosses the y-axis. So remember, this is our y-axis, this is our x-axis. I should have labeled those at the beginning. I'm going to get rid of the these curve. I'm going to get rid of all these functions, and we'll just redraw um, just some sort of generic-looking line, so that we can just point out what the b and m and x and y all mean. 
So we've got our plane like this, and let's say we've got a line that looks something like that. All right. So for something like this, um, our b value, our y-intercept, that's whatever number you'd see on the y-axis right here as you're, you know, you're going to have these labeled, of course, on your, on your graphs. You would have labels there. So whatever number you come across here where the line crosses the y-axis, that is your y-intercept. So if we had something like... Um, if we just number all of these now, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4 going down, 1, 2, 3, 4 going up, we can do the same thing going over to the side there on the x-axis. And so we can see if we've numbered all of this properly, we can see that this line that I've drawn here crosses the y-axis at 1. So that would tell us that our b-value is 1. All right, now, next uh, thing to note is the m value over here represents the slope. And the slope of the line we can calculate using this formula. So I'm going through this kind of quickly and not in too much detail just because we've already covered all of this in detail uh, in past videos. This is just a, sort of to, to refresh your memory a little bit. Um, so, uh, what we've got here, this equation lets you find uh, the slope of the line. So basically what you do is you take two points on the line, so let's say the y-intercept over there and this point over here that seems to be sitting on the x-axis. And between those two points we want to figure out how, how much we have to move up and how much we have to move to the right to get from one point to the next. So usually we'll start at the leftmost point and we'll see, do I have to go up or down uh, to get to the same level as the next point? So if I have to go up, then my slope is going to be positive. If I have to go down, my slope is going to be negative. And then we just count over uh, what, however many units we need to go up. If it's one unit, our rise would be one. And then our run, we would count over how many units it takes to get from this part on the, uh, on the x-axis over to where that point is. So again, in this case, it's only one unit over to the right and one unit up. So we would have our rise being one because we go up one unit, and then our run is one because we go over one unit. So uh, again, if this is, if any of this is confusing, um, I can always make another video on this or you guys can go back and watch the, um, the older ones um, from earlier on in this unit where we talked about rise and run and things like that. Um, there is a formula as well that we talked about for, uh, that, that looks a little bit more mathematical than just using these words, um, and that looked something like this, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And so what these y's and x's in here mean are the x and y coordinates of each of your two points. So you would label the two points, you'd say this one is point number one, and you can say that one is point number two. And so then point number one would have coordinates x1 and y1. This is like, um, if you guys remember when we talked about the general case, this is not specific numbers. This x1 and y1 are placeholders for the actual numbers that would go there. And that one over there would have x2 and y2. So those are just placeholders in an actual example where I've given you an equation of the line or something like that, um, or, or where I've asked you to find the equation of the line, you would take the coordinates of these points and sub them into these places here. So this one on the left, the one that's on the x-axis, looks like it's got coordinates of negative 1, 0, right? It's negative 1 in the x-direction, and it's 0 in the y-direction because it's not moving up or down from the origin. And then that one over there looks like it's got coordinates of 0, 1, right? It's 0 in the x direction. It hasn't moved left or right, but it's moved one unit up in the y direction from the origin. So it would have coordinates of 0, 1. So these are the numbers that we would sub in in place of that x1, y1, x2, and y2 over here. And then we would be able to find the slope that way, right? So for this particular line, if we... Just go ahead and 
do that just for the practice. Uh, x, well, let's, let's, let's start at the top corner here. y2, so the y coordinate of the second point is 1. So we'll put a 1 over there. Uh, we're basically subbing numbers into this equation here. Then we need y1, so it's going to be a minus sign in the middle, and then y1 is going to be 0, right? The y coordinate of the first point is 0. So we would put a 0 there. And I'm going to need a little bit more room. And then in the denominator, x2, the x coordinate of our second point, that's over here, that's going to be 0 minus sign, because that's over here in the equation. And then we look over here, our x coordinate for the first point, so x1, is negative 1. So I put in a minus 1 in there. And if you go ahead and do that calculation, you should get 1 over 1, so a slope of 1, which makes sense because that's uh, the rise and run would give us the same thing. So there's a little bit of a more mathematical way to calculate the slope. Um, and uh, the y-intercept, you can, for, for an example like this, if I've given you the graph, you can just stare at the graph and usually it's not that hard to figure out what the y-intercept is. Um, for looking back at this equation of the line itself, this equation here, the way it works is, I, um, so if I've given you the m and the b, so if I've given you the slope and the intercept, then the way this works is, I could say, if x is equal to 3, what is y going to be equal to? So basically, I give you a number, or you choose a number for x that you sub in here. You have a number for the slope, you have a number for the intercept, so you've got a number times another number plus another number. So it's all math we can do, right? No more letters once we sub in those values. And I'm asking, what's the y value at that point? So you would sub in an x value of like 3, you'd sub in a 3 over here, multiply it by whatever our slope is, in this case is 1, uh, add our um, intercept, and that should give us our uh, value for y at that point. Uh, so hopefully that's, uh, that's making sense. This is just a bit of a review on uh, lines and linear functions, but if you remember what we did a little bit later on in the unit, and basically the last thing we did before these videos stopped really suddenly, is we started talking about points of intersection. So what that means is we've got two lines on the graph that cross each other at some point. And what we want to find is the point where they cross. So we have a line like this, and we have a line like this. And just for this example, I mean, I've made it easy. I've drawn in the second line so that it crosses a point that we already know. But if we didn't already know that point, um, I would ask you to mathematically figure out where um, where these two lines cross each other. So basically, I would want the coordinates of the point where they cross each other. So you have to find an x value, and you have to find a y value. All right, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Right, let me see. This marker is okay, but just let me see if I have a slightly better one over here. I don't know if this one works better. Okay, this one works better, so I'm going to switch markers. Um, all right, so... Uh, without further ado, what we're going to get into now is a points of intersection question. Um, but I was going through the last video that we all uh, that we all got to do together, um, and it was in that video that I introduced a points of intersection example. But what we did first, before just trying to calculate the point of intersection, we uh, graphed the two lines. So if you remember, I had a big Cartesian plane on the right half of the board, and we graphed the two lines um, on it, just so that we had some idea of, of like an estimate where we can expect to find the point of intersection. Um, now, because we've done so much work with graphing, um, with graphing lines, I'm going to show you the more efficient way, the easier way, to calculate the point of intersection. Because if you go back through that example, we don't actually need to graph it to know uh, to, to figure out the answer. You don't have to graph the two lines to find the point of intersection. There's actually no graphing involved um, in the calculation. It's just if you want to check if your answer is right, if you want to have a guideline to 
check if your answer is reasonable. Um, that's when you would draw a graph. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do uh, a points of intersection example. Uh, I had two examples written out and they are kind of short. So um, we'll see if we can get through both of them. So I'm going to call this more points of intersection examples. More points of intersection I'm running out of room. Exam. Okay, just about squeezed it in there. Okay, more points of intersection examples. So what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, start off with you know the same way that I that I always um, same way that I always write our questions for point of for points of intersection. So I'm going to label the question with Roman numerals because I'm going to use numbers to give you the two equations. So basically the way a points of intersection example works is I give you two equations. So the equations will have numbers filled in for the slope and the y-intercept and what I want you to figure out for me is where do these two lines cross. So the way we did it before I would give you equation 1, equation 2, we would graph those two equations get a rough idea of our points of intersection. You know, is, is the x value positive or negative? Is the y value positive or negative? Is it looking more like it's going to be one, one and a half? Is it going to be more like three or four? Or, you know, if we use bigger numbers, is it going to be more like 10 or 15 or, you know, 20 or 100? Right? You could have, we could have anything like that uh, in these examples. Um, but you'll notice when you uh, get a little bit more practice with points of intersection that you don't actually need the graph to do the problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the problem without graphing it and then we'll go back and check by graphing it to see if our answer makes sense. Okay, because if you do the process right um, then you won't need to draw the graph. So I want to get away from drawing the graph just so that we can focus on the math of it but uh, we'll go back to the graph so that we can relate uh, the idea of what's going on, what are we trying to solve, what does it mean, right? Um, so, uh, let's start with equation 1. So equation 1 is y equals 3x. Okay, and equation 2 is y equals x minus 2. So, uh, with these equations, let's pause and think about what a point of intersection question means. So, if we have, let me see if I can just sort of sketch this out. You don't have to draw the graph that I'm about to draw because I'm not going to label things properly. Um, so, if you've got a little Cartesian plane there and you've got a line that's like this and a line that's like that, um, geez, this marker isn't doing so hot either. Um, I think we'll make do. We'll, one, or, one of these markers is going to work um, for the rest of this video. Uh, so what we have is, uh, yeah, so we've got these two lines on here. Basically, if you look at the point where these two lines cross, somewhere over here, right, this point, the x value has to be the same, right? And the y value has to be the same for both, uh, for bo on both lines, right? At this point, along either line this line this point will have the same coordinates right it's it's the same point it's got to have the same coordinates so the important thing is that on in each of these two equations these this this isn't the the graph for these two functions so don't don't get that confused but for these two equations the point of intersection will be the point where if i sub in the same value for x in the first equation as I do in the second equation, so I plug in, let's say, 3 in the first equation and 3 in the second equation, if, the, if it gives me the same y value, that means I've found the point of intersection, all right? Because that is basically telling me that if I plug in the same x value here and here, and it spits out the same y value here and here, then I've found the point of intersection, right? Because the x-coordinate 
is the same and the y coordinate is the same for both equations. So that's the idea behind the steps that we take to solve such a problem. So I'm going to erase that little graph and what we're going to do is we're going to try and solve this. So what we are going to do, the way we're going to work with this is this x is attached to a, a 3 in front of it, right? And this x down here has a subtraction problem going on on that right hand side of the equation. So what we're going to do is we're not going to worry about the x's uh, just yet. We'll get to them in a sec. But if you look, whenever we write a linear function, whenever we write an equation for it, we get y equals mx plus b. We try, <clears throat> we try to always write the y all by itself on the left side, right? So if I need these two y values to be the same, I'm basically saying that 3x is equal to some, some number y, but that y is also equal to x minus 2. Right, that's basically what I'm saying. I'm taking this bit from the first equation. I'm allowed to, you know, take the right-hand side and put it on the left, and take the left-hand side and put it on the right. Um, so this right here is all from the first equation, and this right here is from the second equation. Right, so basically what I'm saying is this 3x has to be equal to some number where that exact same number down here is equal to x minus 2. Right? I hope that makes sense. So we've got 3x is equal to y from the first equation, but that exact same y value is equal to x minus 2 in the second equation. So what we're doing here is we're forcing the y value to be the same in both equations. So now we've dealt with that part of our point of intersection. We need the y value to be the same, and if we start off with this as our first step, it'll force us to get the same y value in both equations. Now we need to get the same x value for both equations. And so the way we're gonna do that is we're actually just gonna solve for x. So what I'm saying here is we've got 3x is equal to y, but y is also equal to x minus two. So that's like saying, um, the number of cookies I have is the same as the number of cookies that Miss Fiona has, but the number of cookies Miss Fiona has is also equal to the number of cookies that Mr. Austin has. So if I say, you know, you've got me with the little hair, and I've got, you know, let's say, like I've got two cookies, one in each hand, all right? And I say that my number of cookies is equal to um, Miss Fiona's number of cookies, He's also got two. And Miss Fiona's number of cookies is equal to uh, Mr. Austin's number of cookies. He's also got two. Let's give everybody a face. All right, so if I say the number of cookies I have is equal to Miss Fiona's, and Miss Fiona's is equal to Mr. Austin's, that means that my number of cookies is also equal to Mr. Austin's number of cookies, right? If Usually you'll see this written as uh, the, the sort of the mathematical way you would write this is if A is equal to B, so A would be the number of cookies I have, B would be the number of cookies Miss Fiona has, and B is equal to C, so B is the number of cookies Miss Fiona has, C is the number of cookies Mr. Austin has, then A is also equal to C. So that means the number of cookies I have is the same as the number of cookies that Mr. Austin has. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So basically what we can do is if we start off with this uh, line where we just put one y in the middle and then this right hand side and this right hand side of the two equations, we throw them on either side of that y. Basically we have this kind of a situation going on, right? This would be our a this is our b, and this is our c. So we know a is equal to b, right? 3x is equal to y. We know b is equal to c, y is equal to x minus 2. Therefore, a has to be equal to c. So that means this 3x is equal to that x minus 2. So if I, I have to erase everybody, unfortunately. Um, so if we do that, we can basically just drop the y 
out of the equation and we write it as 3x is equal to x minus 2. All right, so what we've got now is we've completely eliminated y from the problem for the time being. We've got to bring it back later because we need to find a number for it. Um, but what we do here is now we can just solve for x, right? We only have x's and numbers and an equal sign, and we just need to get it down to x is equal to some number, and then that'll be half the problem. So let's do that. We've got our first step for that is to get all of the terms with x on one side of the equation. So I've got a 3x over here on the left side, and I've got an x over there on the right side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that x over to the left side. So we get 3x minus x is equal to negative 2. Okay, now 3x minus x, I'm going to get rid of this as well. If three, So we've got 3x minus x, we can do that subtraction, that's going to give us 2x. So we get 2x is equal to negative 2. But I don't want 2x, I want just x. So if I want to get from 2x to x, I'm going to divide both sides by 2. Right? Whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other side. And I don't want to do 2x minus x, because then I'll be stuck with another x over on that side. Because if I do it to this side, I have to do it to that side. It's just a mess. So what we do instead is we'll divide by the number that we've got in front. Um, so we've got 2x divided by 2. That's gonna The 2s are going to cancel, and that's going to leave us with just an x on the left side. And then on the right side, we've got negative 2 divided by 2, which is going to give us negative 1. So this tells us that the x value, notice that we've only got one number for x, and this is telling us it's not as clear as what we were doing up here by uh, forcing the y value to be the same for both equations. But what we've done when we did this is we're also forcing the x value to be the same for both equations because we know we're going to get just one number for x down here. Right? So if we get just one number for x down here, that means it's got to be the same x value in both equations. And uh, now we just need to find the y value. So to find the y value, if you look back at what we did at the beginning, we forced the y value to be the same in both equations by writing it out this way, right? We only left a room for there to be sort of one number in the middle. We can't have uh, 3x is equal to something and then uh, x minus 2 is equal to something else. We need the y value to be the same. So because of the way we've set up the start of our solution, um, we can actually sub in this x equals 1 into either equation 1 or equation 2, and it should give us the same answer for y. I'm going to sub it into both, just so that you can see what I mean. So we'll sort of divide this down the middle here, this left half of the board. So we'll do equation 1 over on the left side, and we'll do equation 2 over on the right side. Like so. Okay, so um, on the left side we have y is equal to 3x. And on the, left, uh, uh, on the left side, we have y equals 3x, and on the right side, we have y equals x minus 2. So what I'm going to do is, because we found that x is equal to negative 1, I'm going to sub in that x value uh, into both of these, right? So on the left side, it'll be y is equal to, instead of 3 times x, it'll be 3 times negative 1. And on the right side, instead of x minus 2, it'll be negative 1 minus 2. So now if I go ahead and I do the calculation, on the left side, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. And on the right side, negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. So this tells us that our y-coordinate for our point of intersection needs to be negative 3. So we've got y is equal to, y is equal to negative 3. And so we can put a box around that as well. Right there. Fantastic. Okay, so what we've done now is we've found the x value of the point of intersection and the y value of the point of intersection. And we can be quite confident that we've done it right, because when we sub in the same x value into both equations, it spits out the same y value. So that's a good, I, that's a step in the right direction. If you're, if you're getting different numbers here, 
your x value is wrong or you've messed up a calculation here. So if you're plugging in the same x value uh, into both of these equations, you're doing the calculation right and you get the same y value, fantastic, that's all you need to do. Um, but just so that we can be doubly sure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly uh, graph these two lines so that we can see what's going on. Because right now we just have two equations, we did a bunch of weird math with them, we got two numbers out at the end of it, uh, and while I do try and keep the, the focus on what we're actually trying to solve, it can be really easy to lose sight of what we're actually doing and what we're trying to find and what it means. So I, I could say, you know, we're trying to find an x and y, and you go and find x and y, but then you don't really fully understand what it means, what the x and y values mean. So let's graph these two, and hopefully that'll become a little bit clearer. So draw in our Cartesian plane, like so. And I'll put in the sort of dashed grid lines that I try to use as a, as a placeholder uh, to sort of help me landmark where my points should be drawn. This is hopefully easier for you guys if you have grid paper in your notebooks, but I know that grid paper isn't exactly the easiest thing to get a hold of there, so um, maybe we're all going through this same struggle of drawing in these dotted lines. Um, okay, label our axes, y and x, and now we'll just put in some tick marks so that we've got room for some, um, some numbers uh, on our on our axes. Try and keep the tick marks uh, halfway between the, the dashed lines um, so that we can have everything evenly spaced. So then we've got zero in the middle there and then we'll just number these. We've got one, two, three, and four. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Positive one, positive two, positive three, positive four. Going that way. All right, so what we've got there is our little Cartesian plane. And now we can plot these two functions. So for y equals 3x, hopefully you guys remember how to graph this. Um, you could do it with a table of values where you say, okay, for x equal to 0, y has got to be equal to this. For x is equal to 1, y has got to be this. Or what we can do is we can throw on our y-intercept, and then from that we can... Um, from that we can just hop from one point to the next using the slope. So the thing we need first is our y-intercept. Now for equation one, for the y-intercept should be something that's added or subtracted to or from this 3x. So since there's nothing, we know that it's plus zero. Our intercept is zero. So that means that this line passes through the origin, right? It crosses the y-axis at a value of zero. Now to get from this point to the next one, well, let's take our slope. So our slope, this is for line number one. So our slope is equal to three, right? So that means that if we've got our rise over run, that's equal to three, basically three over one. So that means that for every three units I go up, I have to move over one unit to the right. So if I do that, we start at zero, we go up one, two, three, we go over to the right, and we put a dot right there. And I could do the same thing in the opposite direction, just in the interest of time, because we're already at 34 minutes. Basically, going up and to the right is exactly the same as going left and then down. So instead of going up three units and one unit to the right, I'm going to go down three units and one unit to the left. So if I do that, I get one, two, three down, and one to the left, and we get a point right there. And now, if I can just connect the dots, we get something that looks like this. And that's our first line. That's our line for uh, equation 1. So that's y equals 3x, and I'll just label in that line, y equals 3x. Alright, now let's draw in the other one. The other one is y equals x minus 2. So we'll start off by noticing that our y-intercept for equation number two is 
not zero, but negative two this time, right? We've got something that's being added or subtracted to the x term, that's gonna be our y-intercept, but we have to carry that negative sign with us. So our y-intercept is negative two. So that means that on our graph, we find negative two on the y-axis, we drop a dot. That's our point for the y-intercept of the second line. Now, if we look at uh, the x term, there's nothing attached to it. There's no number attached to it. So that means that our slope is equal to 1. Or basically, that's the same thing as saying that our rise over run is equal to 1 over 1. So for every 1 unit I go up, I've got to go 1 unit to the right. So from here, I go up 1 to the right, I go up 1 to the right, up 1 to the right, up 1 to the right. I've got a little bit of a problem because I haven't crossed the other line yet, right? If I just connect these dots, I'm only going to get up to about here before I stop. I know that line's slightly, slightly curved, but I think it gets the idea across still. So what I need to do now is I need to extend this line in the opposite direction. So if I wanted to go point by point, then I could do the same thing that I did up here, where instead of going up and to the right, I'll go down and to the left. So for every unit I go down, I have to go one to the left. And then that gives us this dot right here, which is on the other line as well. We can extend that to the end. I know that line's slightly curved. That's just because of the way I've drawn it, but the lines should, be, uh, should both be straight. Um, something like that. So then this is y equals x minus 2. All right, and so there we go. Those are our two lines, and we can see that they cross at this point over here, right? This dot right here they, is where they both cross. And if we look at the x and y coordinates of that point, well, our x coordinate is negative 1, right? Which is exactly what we got when we were doing the calculation. And then our y coordinate is this negative 3 down here, which is also exactly what we got when we were doing the calculation. So... Um, even though last time we started off by um, by solving these problems using um, uh, using the graph first, so we drew the graph first to give us an idea. Okay, our x and y values should both be negative. Now let's go and do the calculation. You can see that it's not actually necessary to do the calculation after you've drawn the graph. We can use the graph to check our answer, or if you're confident enough, you don't even need to draw the graph at all. Um, it's still a good idea to keep in mind the idea of what's going on. Um, as long as you can do the math, that's great, but if you can keep in mind that this is what it means, that these are two lines and this is the point where they cross and that's what we're trying to find, this is the coordinates of that point, then um, sometimes that helps you get through the problem. If you understand what you need to do, sometimes you can sort of figure out your way through it as you go along instead of memorizing just a process that you don't understand. All right, so. Hopefully that all makes sense. I was going to go through a second example, but I think I will leave it there for today because we're already at 38 minutes. Um, I'm hoping to get more regular with this. I know it's the last week, but I'm going to try and put out a video every day um, sometime in the afternoon, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, will, uh, I will keep posting videos this week. Now, I know your school year is done uh, as far as I as far as I know, it's it's done this Friday, right? In a, in a few days' time. So uh, if you guys would like, I can keep putting out videos into the summer just for you guys to to keep learning. It won't be uh, anything that I give you assignments on unless you want them. Um, it won't be anything that I test you on. But you know, stuff. If you guys wanna, if you wanna do some stuff over the summer um, with more, you know, linear functions or quadratics, or I know one of you is. Uh, um, trying to get into uh, some universities right now. If any of the rest of you have stuff that you would like to do over the summer for math or science or, I don't know, music theory, you know, any of those things that, uh, that I used to do with you guys down there, um, let me know and uh, we can try and work something out. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for now. If there's anything else I remember that I needed to say, then I will say it at the start of the next video. But uh, as always, if you have any questions, let me know, send me an email, leave a comment or something like that. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you all next time around. Have a good one.